Okay, good morning on this side of the world. Good evening on the other side of the world. Um, welcome to Artivism, the Power of Art for Social Transformation. Um, thank you to Adelphi University, um, Goddesman Libraries, Teachers College, Columbia University, and Sync for, Home, uh, for Hope uh, for sponsoring Artivism. Um, today we have Dr. Maduro Duta, uh, the Director and Lead of Research and International Collaborations. Madura has 20 years of experience in the fields of social development, sustainable livelihoods based on traditional cultural assets, women empowerment, and creative entrepreneurship. Other than her present organization, Banglanatak.com, she has worked in UNESCO New Delhi as National Program Officer in All India Artisans and Craft Workers Association as its executive director and has short stints as an advisor for corporate social responsibility programs. She has a PhD from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, and MA degrees in sociology from Calcutta University and sustainable Staffordshire University in the UK. Banglanatak.com is a 21 plus year old social enterprise working with culture and development. We work, they work across India with a mission to foster inclusive and sustainable development using culture-based approaches. They work for the protection of rights of women, children, and indigenous people. They are a global partner of UNWTO, national partner to UNESCO, accredited to UN ECOCOC, special consultative status, and UNESCO ICH Committee for Advisory Services. They have 80 plus full-time team members at HO with Kolkata and branches in Jaipur and Joa. Their flagship program on culture and development is called Art for Life. Welcome Dr. Datura. Thank you. Thank you, Anji. So uh, thank you all of you for being here to uh, listen to the presentation that I have. So can I share my screen and start? Yes, you should be able to. So are you able to uh, see as well as listen? Beautiful, yes. Okay, great. So uh, I think RJ gave a very elaborate introduction to uh, my background as well as what we do. So I'll quickly go into the, uh, the program that we are presenting today, which is called Art for Life. And uh, about us, so our NGO name is Contact Base and our uh, brand is banglanatak.com by the name of which we have a website. So I'll quickly go through this. So uh, my presentation today is basically on culture and development. And uh, when we talk about culture as an organization, we essentially talk about intangible cultural heritage, which is the living heritage uh, of any place or any country. Now, uh, intangible cultural heritage is a term used by UNESCO, and uh, it is globally used now technically for oral traditions, performing arts, societal practices, festivals, traditional knowledge, and crafts. The, key features of intangible cultural heritage, I would like to sort of emphasize on because those are the features on which our program is essentially built. So one is it is handed down from generation to generation. So it's traditional and it is something that is passed on within the families. It reflects a community's cultural and social identity. So there's a community or a collective involved whose cultural and social identity is linked to the kind of living heritage that we are talking about or that would, we would be talking about. Interesting thing is authors are unknown in the sense that it is, it is, a, it is an asset, it is a heritage that belongs to a particular community. So it's not like any individual is doing it. And it's beautifully, UNESCO calls it living heritage because it is by the people. So it is con constantly evolving, it is developing, and it is recreating. So it is, it is on a very interesting continuum of tradition and modernity at the same time. So, and art and culture constitutes a huge asset base, a huge resource in India, which provides 
livelihood traditionally to millions of artists which have been providing that historically and which have the capacity to actually create sustainable livelihoods for millions with the right kind of support and the empowerment. So quickly, because culturally it is so different and we have people from different parts of the world, I would like to quickly go through some of the art forms just to show you what kind of social, physical, uh, cultural space we are looking at before I get into the program. So say, for example, handloom weaving, you can see here that, and, and these properties are true for all these uh, traditional art forms that we are talking about, that it's handmade. Everything is made by hand. There is no, uh, the, the machine that is used or the technology that is used is also driven by hand. So it's very low energy and handmade things. And the other important thing is it is a regular, it is part of a regular lifestyle. You can see a photograph below where a woman is cooking and then there is a loom where a woman is weaving a beautiful sari. So all crafts are lifestyle products. So they are very comfortable pursuing them and practicing them within the household as part of their regular lifestyle. That is a very, very important part. Say for example, a folk painting. They are also very specialized as communities. For example, they use natural colors. So they have the knowledge of local flora and fauna. They know how to make a color that will stick on the paper or different uh, uh, surfaces. And there's a lot of technical skills involved in what they are doing because they paint on long scrolls and it is a storytelling medium. So they, they write the story in the form of a song, they give music, they sing the song as they unfurl the, uh, the, the paintings, which are called the Patachitra. So then there is the uh, tribal dance. This is just one of the many forms. Now, very interestingly, these are mythology based. These are, these are linked to the physical space where they belong, the color, the topography, the texture, everything. So all these things become very integral to the cultural art forms that we are talking about. The folk music, they are very syncretic. At the same time, they are very ritualistic also because they are related to various social and cultural uh, events of these communities. It is always festival oriented. There is some kind of celebration involved where the community participates. This is a very important uh, area, which is again, very, very crucial to the industry that I'm talking about is the, we call it the Guru Shishya Parampara. That is the way the skills, the traditional skills are transmitted from the seniors to the younger population in a form which is very organic, which is very cardinal to their own culture and their own community. But it is only them who have the skill and the knowledge and the specialization to pass it on to the younger generation so that it continues. And very important, all these craft forms, even when they are livelihoods, even when they are businesses, even when they can turn into industry, they are all emotionally connected to the community. So the communities are artists inside. They are creative people inside and they get a lot of emotional satisfaction out of even the livelihood that they are pursuing. That is a fundamental component as well. For example, a metal craft. Here, the artist who is making it knows the, the chemistry of the metal. They know what temperature to use, they know how to do the firing, they know how to use a wax, they know how to sculpt. So imagine a single community having this entire skill base to create those wonderful uh, metal products and completely by hand. And then comes a very, very uh, interesting uh, product, which is, which we called Madur or they are made of natural fiber. So the grass photograph that you're seeing, that grass is turned into something that you see on the right, which is the handwoven mat, which they make on simple looms. Similarly, they weave jute. You can see on the left that there is a tree branch and the loom, 
which is made of bamboo is just fixed on the tree and the woman is sitting and weaving. And the final products look like these, which you can see on the right of the screen. So imagine the amount of skill of measurement, of color combination, of, of all these kind of, they, are, they have the scientific technical skills of creating these things because from this kind of grass, they are transforming them into regular day-to-day -day products. And these are integrally linked to their lifestyles. So these mats, for example, are co also called cool mats because they remain cool in summer. And these places mostly are very hot and humid. So these mats are used. We have also seen in our childhood uh, these kinds of mats being used, which they put on the floor, because they are cool mats. It's comfortable to sit or sleep on them when it's very hard summer. And today, these artisans are, as I said, that is an industry. They are also making diversified products out of. So you can see the products. Obviously, there has been some kind of training, exposure, and a lot of intervention. But today, with time, because they are, this is a living heritage from them and the skill is theirs. They have the power to transform it the way they want and the way they like. So if there is some kind of a creative empowerment, they can actually do wonders with the skills that they have and change those products to things that are liked by the contemporary world and can be used by them. So now that is just to introduce in a glimpse what I mean by the cultural heritage of India and what we work with. And now coming to the creative economy part, it is one of the most dynamic economic sectors in the world. And Asia is one of the largest bases of uh, creative economy in terms of visual arts, crafts, music, and everything. And India also has an extremely rich base. So this is a concept that has been coming in and seeping in much later in India. And we are still sort of, as a sector, as an industry, as a country, we are striving uh, to achieve different kinds of things. As you can understand that most 70% of these communities are rural. They are difficult to reach. They are remote. And they're the entire industry that they have are, are traditional. So they had a context in the beginning, which probably over time has changed and they are changing as per the context. So there's a lot of social, cultural, and ecological complexity that are also there within this industry, which makes it very interesting. At the same time, it has huge potential to uh, turn into a full-fledged creative economy. But the challenges are the following, which I will address in, our, in, in the program that we do. One is it is endangered. Many are endangered because they don't practice it anymore because they have lost the context. So unless there is some kind of an external intervention or some kind of an exposure to show them the new context or to give them the inspiration for building something for the new context and the new world, it has a tendency of getting lost. And that is because the younger generations are not practicing it. It is not the patronage system or the, or the social system within which it used to be practiced is not there anymore and many other factors. But then losing these skills is a very, very high risk area, which uh, are being addressed by many, many organizations across the country. Uh, so loss of traditional skills and livelihood because of the context, as I said. And the other risk is when they are ready for the new context and the new market, there are a lot of market risks because it is, it is, it is very difficult for these communities to actually explain and communicate how much, of, how much of technical skill, how much of capacity, how much of knowledge, and how much of traditional value goes into what they make and why their products, even if they look very simple, are, are mostly very premium products. So, I mean, this, the, 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 whole, the whole culture of use and throw was traditionally not there in India. So the fact that they are having to uh, manage the new market expectations becomes extremely challenging because 
most of these uh, cultural heritage practices, products, these are not known to the world in the way that they should be. Then there are the environmental risks because most of these are sustainable. They are essentially based on local raw materials. So they use local raw materials, local. So the whole process is, is handmade, no power, no electricity, no machine, no big uh, industry kind of thing. So it's very, very environmental friendly. But then to speed up their work or to keep up or to cope, to cope up with the, with the market expectations in the world, they are coming away from the ecologically sustainable processes of production because they do not realize how important that is for the markets that are changing only today. So, and then finally, we have faced the risk of the pandemic, which we can't ignore at all, considering we have all seen how it has sort of impacted our all our societies and uh, communities. So coming to the project, uh, we believe that culture has the power to transform lives economically, socially, and uh, uh, environmentally and create sustainable livelihoods and contribute to an holistic well-being of the community. So well-being is also becoming a very important indicator and we have been advocating for it for a very long time to say that it is not only the livelihood, the income, the standard of living, it is the well-being. It, it is the holistic well-being of community that is, that is, that is important to achieve. And Corona has taught us more than anything else how important well-being is for resilience and for a community or a collective or people to survive. So we work across India. Uh, currently, I'll focus mostly on the communities that we have been working in West, uh, with in West Bengal for the last 20 years, about covering about 40,000 rural families of folk artists. So our uh, approach has has three pillars. One is safeguarding the art. As I said, the challenge is losing the art, so or or losing the traditional skills, the traditional knowledge, the uh, the the technical skills. So safeguarding the art is extremely important because without that we can't move forward. Then empowering the artists, the actual practitioners who are making it, empowering them in a way that they can actually contextualize their art themselves in the current world, in the modern world, and not only make a living, but also lead a life of pride and dignity, knowing that what they are doing is something extremely, extremely valuable, important, and artistic and nobody else can do that. So, uh, and the, the, the final and, and a very important part is because I said that these are all community driven, we work with collectives. So we work with villages. Usually these kinds of communities where they are settled, these villages have homogeneous population of these communities practicing an art form culturally in India. So picking up the collective, working with the collective, and the village and the community as a whole is a very important area because that is what sort of takes them forward with the kind of, uh, with the kind of power that, that really we have seen during Corona that the kind of resilience that these people have shown even when they had no business, no income, no money is, is, is way more than what we have uh, seen in the urban places, just because it is, it is they have that whole community sense of community and sense of belonging in a collective. So we strengthen, we try to strengthen that and not move away from that. So safeguarding art, what we do is we do cultural mapping. We do uh, a lot of documentation. The documentations are in the form of films, uh, uh, records, uh, books, uh, online publications. We have a partnership with Google Art and Culture. So we have lots of digital stories there. And this is how we continue to exchange. We continue to collaborate so that we can uh, not only document, but also exchange these knowledge in different platforms so that the world comes to know about the real uh, traditional forms 
and the practitioners themselves directly. So the safeguarding is not only just documenting it, but also making it usable, shareable for creating awareness across so that the value of these art forms increase and the communities themselves also start practicing those. Secondly, as I said, the empowering artists part where there is a, there is a skill transmission within the community, which is strengthened. And then there are some external interventions on design, on what the current context is in the world. And this happens not only for craft, but for music, for theater, for performing arts, all kinds. Then uh, creating awareness and recognition, creating their brand, creating, creating their identity is extremely important. And definitely the ways of doing business where a lot of youth come forward, exposure and direct market linkage is very important and institution building. So the fact that they would have to carry on the business in the modern world also involves uh, re acknowledging, uh, registering and being able to manage an institution. So in, in whatever form it is, the the, in, in the, the, the institution building is again very, very closely linked to the culture of a community. Uh, all kinds of institutions does not work everywhere because of the way the communities produce. In some forms, the communities produce within individual families. In some, the families come together to produce certain parts of a particular uh, craft uh, together. And then take it to an individual level at a much later stage. So there are lots of layers and institution building is a very sensitive area as well. And then finally developing the villages as cultural hubs. Here we have created a few assets or a few products, uh, I would say. One is a village festival. So we have right now about 20 active community hubs. The communities own these festivals. So the communities are trained and empowered to manage these festivals. So we have been supporting them with these festivals for some time in both in uh, funding and operations, but then over time, it has got mainstreamed within the community's activities as artists, as musicians, as, as, as artists in whatever form they are working in. So these village festivals have not only created the identity and the brand of the community and the village, but it has also attracted people from all over the world and also neighboring villages who had no idea that such artist villages existed. And the kind of, uh, the kind of environment that it creates and the, and the, and the natural, natural exposure and exchange and business, everything that happens has just made these villages so, so active cultural hubs in terms of tourism, in terms of cultural exchange, in terms of workshops, in terms of artists moving out, going out to different parts of the world to do exchange programs, etc. We also have in all these villages, there's a resource center because Infrastructure, you have to understand in these kinds of rural villages are very less. So with the help of the government, we have been able to form a community resource center. Again, it is built on community land and owned by the community. So it's a collective property. And every resource center has a folk art center and a community museum. So everywhere in all these places where there are the resource centers, we have a community museum which talks about their shared heritage. So there is this discourse now that museums are, uh, the, the whole learning from a museum becomes very biased, very one-sided because it's, it's not done by involving the communities who have actually lived through that heritage uh, in ways. But then the movement of eco museum is coming in in a big way. And we had started this long time back, but it was done with the community, with full participation of the community to say that you tell your stories. We will write and portray and depict your stories, your heritage. So it's oral history, which are depicted in different ways. It's the work of the master artists who probably are very old. Some of them have passed away by now. So their arts are uh, uh, demonstrated there, are, are put up there so that the younger generations can learn because they are so high quality. So this have also become a center of attraction for the 
uh, village based festivals as well as tourism. And we do a lot of cultural exchange and collaboration, which is a very, very strong tool to take the whole cultural movement forward. So for example, we have a village in Noya, uh, which is the scroll painters village. Uh, 15 years back, there were only a few artists who, who did this painting and who used to go out and they all worked with very, very, very renowned uh, fine artists or uh, architects or other people. But then as a village, it did not have anything. So today it is one of the most active uh, village hubs with over 250 Patachitra artists and extremely important earlier women used to work inside homes. Women would work in their time after doing all their household chores and they never got out to, to even establish themselves as artists. Nobody knew about them. They just helped in the family, but they were artists themselves. So today the women have taken a lead here and there are uh, there's a lot of leadership from the women and there are younger women who are fantastic artists who are traveling all over the world. So it has really sort of created a very positive environment in the village. So this has become a great tourism destination. And uh, we've also used geographical indication for these villages because that also becomes a very important collective identity building tool. For example, the musicians. So they are the folk musicians and they are from the Gorbhanga village. And they were a completely ostracized community. They were marginalized and completely ostracized from the society. Today, it is an internationally noble and popular music hub where musicians just turn up or they have their festivals and they are uh, performing there. Even other than festivals, they have the, what they call akras, which are small sort of spaces, community spaces where different museums musicians are leading the uh, programs it's 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 a it's a different transformation altogether this is a village of muslim community where the women traditionally did something called katha which is uh, using thread to tie scrap fabric so the scraps at home were tied together to make products for either sitting or for you know as shawls or as 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 uh, as quilts so but then they did it for home and they were very, very, again, very marginalized uh, earlier. Today, there are 600 plus women who are working as small and big entrepreneurs. They do their own katha, they sell, they have direct contact with the market. And the women have come forward even to, because they are empowered today, they have come forward to even build schools for their girl children who could not go to schools earlier. So these kinds of empowerment we have seen through these movements. There is this metal uh, village. Again, this was just a community. Today, it is one of the destinations uh, which is mainstream by the tourism government. And every day people flock there, students of design institutes go there and they are doing their own workshop exchanges, interactions. It's a very independent way of uh, growing and building uh, with their craft and art form. So the village festival has really created a lot of brand for these villages. And what has happened is because these, many of the artists, uh, both men and women, but especially women I would mention has come out and they have got awards, they have got recognition. So their mobility has increased. Their earlier, they didn't, the kind of respect that they did not have, they have that respect, they have that say, they have that mobility, and that has changed the, the, the social structures uh, and the way the younger generations are, are both getting educated and learning the skill in very different ways. And it's very, very positive. These are some of the, uh, geographical indications, and I would like to just uh, emphasize that intellectual property rights is not something that is very easy to uh, sort of establish for a community traditional art, and geographical indication has, become, has been an extremely good tool for us to be able to establish the collective identity of the communities. Other than that, uh, of course, the rights. So what happens is here, for example, musicians, there are lots of lots of songs, music, lots of things that have been used by big industries that have 
been used by Bollywood and everything. But those rights or those returns have not gone to the actual artists. So that is also a very important area which we are still working on as to how to empower the artists to be able to protect their own rights, to have their own creative rights for their own creative assets and their products. So this is a, this is a picture of one of the community uh, museums. Again, you can see visitors, you can see workshops happening uh, here where uh, there's a painting workshop. And uh, these are some of the art and music residencies that we do. We do a lot and, uh, and across different art forms. And we believe that culture really binds and connects as Yanis was also mentioning. And it is, it is, it is the way to build in social cohesion, social inclusion, uh, friendship, connectivity, it's, 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 it, it just goes beyond borders in every way. And it really connects. And there is no rural, urban thing. I mean, when, when we bring the artists together, it's like a movement that they themselves create with the, uh, with the creative language that they are working in. So we have had groups who, who have not known the language, even not English, but they have gone to the villages, they have done their cultural exchanges with the artists, they have come back and done, did fantastic productions, joint productions, co-productions. So how is that possible? That is possible because they are talking art in their ways. So this has been a tremendous force for new innovation, for confidence building, for empowerment, and really for breaking the barriers, breaking the borders and really uh, connecting uh, in a positive way. So, just to show that this, this is something that is increasing. We, we invite and explore these kinds of opportunities all the time. So these are the different countries who have come here, the artists who have been like uh, on, the, on, on the lower right, you can see there's one young Patachitra artist who was uh, at a program by Smithsonian. So they did a program at Smithsonian, they painted stories, they, they did workshops. And then there are so many places in Europe uh, where they have gone and where those artists have come and they have continued to have those relationships, which is the most, it is not that they do the workshop and come back. They still have over, over five years, seven years, 10 years, they still have those relationships. This is a, a team which had come uh, to, uh, uh, from Norway to do a wood workshop. And there was a exhibition and a co-production uh, and, a, and, a, and a joint exhibition by them by which they uh, hosted in Calcutta after doing the workshop in the village. And uh, there are two festivals that I would also like to mention. One festival that we do is called World uh, Sur Jaha, which is World Peace Music Festival. Uh, and we have been doing this for the last 10 years. This year we could not do. And uh, over 30 countries have participated. And this is something that was created. This is a free festival. And this is something that was created by us just to create a platform for the rural musicians of the rural musicians we are working with and the musicians from all across the world to come and meet. It started like that because we wanted to give them that platform, educate them, train them, empower them. But this has really gone into a peace festival movement which is free and which is very, very organic. Uh, and the other rural urban connect that we have created is another festival called Folk Suffer where we say heritage connects. So it's the local global connect. These are the folk artists who many people, even in Bengal, who live in the urban areas have not seen in their lives. If I did not work with these directly, I wouldn't have seen many in, in, in my uh, uh, life. So it is very interesting because we then bring these kinds of groups to Calcutta, to the city. And this is again a free festival and the city people, they experience this directly. They interact with the artists, they see, they watch. And this is how we not only connect, but also create that exposure, not only for the folk artists, but also for the audience and the, and the, and the urban people who, who are less aware of the tremendous skills that exist in the rural world. So this is how art becomes a way of, of actually uh, connecting uh, the uh, rural urban 
uh, sector. So, and then finally, during Corona, we have seen that the digital presence has become very, very important. And there's a fantastic way of directly connecting artists. So definitely digitally, uh, the rural India was very marginalized. It's still very marginalized. But during Corona, I think this has come up like, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's like a push to say that, I mean, these people will not survive if you don't bring them and connect them to the world because we can still talk, see each other when we were completely in the homes, but they were completely disconnected. So there was a lot of insecurity in the way of not knowing what is happening just outside their village. So we could train them in, in using digital platforms, in using social media, Facebook Live, and the performers performed, the artists did online workshops, and they still carry on online workshops. So they, are, they do online workshops, they do workshops with school children in US, in Europe. They, uh, so they participate in different things. They do live programs, they connect with buyers. And then there are different digital uh, apps and spaces where we also promote these musicians because that is how they can really be connected to the audience directly you know there's no middleman there is no agency they you can hear them you know them directly so that that part is extremely critical for them to really have the benefit of uh, their own art forms and uh, yeah as i said Finally, these are the ways and it is still growing. We are still evolving. We are still strengthening, but this, this is something that is very important right now. So, you know, overall, I would say that one part of it is actually reviving, revitalizing and sustaining the art forms. The other part is how that has contributed to not only income and poverty alleviation, but also to a kind of social cultural and emotional life that is very, very satisfying for an entire community. And during Corona, we have seen the issues of migration, especially in our country. And, and it is being realized more and more that local economies based on local culture, local raw materials, local resources, and where a community is involved, satisfied, living in their own space, creating in their own space in a comfort in a comfortable area rather than a factory or something is, is much, much uh, more sort of uh, gives much better returns in terms of a holistic uh, well being. So that is what the program is all about. I, uh, I think I have been able to sort of, it's, it's quite complex and uh, lots of uh, sub issues. But uh, overall, I hope I have been able to do justice to this session. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I can take questions. Uh, so I'll just stop sharing. This was amazing. The, the, the color. Um, I, I picked up a couple of key terms, I think. Uh, first, that um, art is the, is the universal language. Right, it's one we can all speak and share and understand. I love pride, dignity, respect, and safeguarding art. I think with pride and dignity comes so much more, uh, perhaps peace even, right, on a bigger scale. Um, the sustainable materials, right? We all know what tanneries do uh, to workers, to the environment. And uh, that's something we all have to be aware of and advocate for by not buying leather and other goods, if at all possible, right? Some you need, but you don't need that beautiful leather jacket, right? <laughs> if, if, if it could be made with, made with sustainable material, if you really know what these workers are going through and suffering from and what it's doing to the environment. Um, just very quickly, I want to know, have you ever done festivals in, in, in the New York area? Um, I would like, love to connect with you maybe to do something along with Malini and the organization she that knows and the Delphi. Yes. Yeah. That would be wonderful. We, yeah. we are open. Uh, the artists travel all over. We haven't done any festival in New York, but we have been doing online exchange program with two schools uh, in uh, New York. Uh, right now, what is going on is with the Sidwell School, 
so, uh, but but uh, we are very open to exploring uh, this area yeah. and uh, uh, are very uh, we we are very active in this uh, space. If if the artists get opportunities, we will sort of definitely. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. They've been to Washington. Amazing. I just love how you present it and um, the, the, the way that you have a community resource center. Um, all the slides were wonderful. And um, the fact that you are bringing out the artists and um, you know showing their work, uh, which I think every artist gets very anxious for a stage and a platform. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and that they're able to, you're also at the same time. Um, helping during the COVID, you know, where um, people need something to get away from and to to embrace, you know? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mother Mother. This is Nagaraj. Uh, really, I'm very happy to see this. Uh, thanks for your presentation, because uh, really, I'm very, uh, I'm also uh, from a village from uh, India. Really, I never think you presenting this, all this kind of uh, presentation in years. Uh, really, I'm very happy to see this. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and um, Nakaraju, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. You are a student, correct? Yes, I am a student. Ah, uh, so then maybe we can work together getting um, Dr. Madura's organization or festival onto Adelphi. I yeah, will email sure, you. Definitely. Yeah, yes. sure, definitely, ma'am. Thank you. I will email you. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, any other questions or comments? Let me find. I have a question. Yes. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. So inspiring work. That's an amazing work that you do. Thank how you. I, I would like to ask, uh, how easy, easy was it for you to begin? Mm -hmm. And how easy is it for you to keep on going, you know, in this, <laughs> this time? In this time, you mean? Yes. So it has not been easy at all during the COVID time, because I think it's, it's something that, that is completely new to the entire world. And uh, many generations, people have not seen anything like this, uh, this kind of a pandemic. So it has been very difficult. But uh, again, because uh, we work in a in a collective, uh, it it becomes easier in a way uh, because then there is a kind of support uh, which is more than just the economic thing. And uh, obviously, in India, I would say, I mean, many many organizations have come forward to partner and to build networks to support these uh, rural artisans across the country uh, so you know so people who are good in marketing people who are good in in the in the, or or they are in the industry or people who have the kind of money to support and people like us who are connected directly to the community so all these kinds of different kinds of organizations persons individuals people have come together to really sort of contribute in a way which is tremendous in terms of, you know, really handholding them. And we have seen the results of that. And now things are picking up again and hope it goes like this. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, just very quickly before we close up, um, thank you so much, Dr. Maduro, for being our artivist for today. Next Monday, April 11th, we have uh, speakers from the UK, uh, um, UK-based Czech artist Teresa Buskova in conversation with Polish singer Carolina Wegzergen and Tina Francis, a stitch innovator. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Artivism for Shared Humanity, the same for Facebook. Um, all these presentations for those that agree to be recorded are on our YouTube channel, Artivism for Shared Humanity. Um, let's see, yes, any other questions or comments? Well, I have something here. Yes. I uh, experience all these forms of art that, uh, that were presented. I visit uh, about four or five times uh, West Bengal, and I saw from close range the waving, the pen.
painting, the patasitra, the chow mask making, the chow dance, and mostly the folk music uh, parts, because I was involved for uh, re recording uh, artists in the villages, because um, it's not easy to bring the artists to the city, to the studio, that they never experience microphones and things like that. So. On the contrary, I saw that Bangladesh Attack had an incredible program of uh, working for three, four, five, six months in order to scout different areas to find around 150, 200 uh, musicians each time. And then later on, we were more ready to record them in the villages in, in all parts of West Bengal in these five, trips, four or five trips that I made, you know. So it's, uh, all I can say is that this model that Bangladesh Attack is working is not only for India. It's a model for many other parts of the world. And we, I will be surprised to hear that I, I, uh, I just tried to introduce even to European sphere, this kind of work that they're doing because there are music, if we talk about music, there are music, uh, types of music that they're just wither away, you know, they just disappear. And uh, there are not any more people to involve and to pass this kind of tradition. And I saw with my eyes and my ears uh, how they work uh, and how uh, these, kind of work has um, influence and uh, br brought results. Uh, six months or a year after I traveled to these places again, and I saw how the community as communities of these musicians, they're really getting the standards of living, uh, hygienic and uh, more self-esteem, you know, higher, and how they pass this knowledge and the tradition to their kids and to the community. So uh, I'm thankful for Ms. Duta's presentation. And uh, I just wanna Thank say, you, this is an incredible uh, uh, example that I got in my life for visiting year after year West Bengal. Thank you for that. Thank you, Marcus. I would, I would definitely, Definitely like to add that, uh, of course, I have met him in our office in Calcutta and in the field and he's worked so closely with our team and wonderful the way he, the way you sort of uh, shared your experience. Uh, and I would also like to say that these are the kinds of interactions and exchanges and exposures that I was exactly talking about, which have also given the musicians in the rural areas also us as an organization, so much more sort of opportunity and exposure and a kind of on, and, and ideas to do new things, to connect. So I think it is a very critical part of our work to be able to reach out to more and more people like Marcus, like all of you, and you know, uh, work together in some way so that we can give these uh, artists a kind of platform. Uh, from where they can grow and we learn in the process. Thank you. I couldn't agree more about um, using this as a model um, in other areas, in other countries. It's, it's just so beautiful. And I, I talked about pride, the word pride, and I see that in Nagaraju, pride. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, it's uh, beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, so happy you turned you, your camera you? on. Yes, ma. Can you can you show your third slide? My third slide is there is a small. Uh, they are making something handmade. Uh, that my mom will make that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still, it is Beautiful. going on in the villages, ma'am, uh, because uh, uh, many people uh, depends on this uh, work. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, thank and, you. And uh, Madura, what we do at the end of each presentation is we ask our artists to um, leave us with a takeaway, um, something you will take away from this presentation or something you would like all of us to take away. What would that be? So uh, my takeaway? Yeah, I think uh, the fact that I met all of you wonderful 
people and i have the opportunity to connect with all of you so that you know we can we can build a network to do something more in these lines because i think uh, i mean we have a lot to learn and to share and uh, so and and you have a lot of experience and your own field of work and i think the most important takeaway for us as an organization and for me as an individual is to be able to connect with all of you in future and uh, and right now knowing all of you uh, and 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 taking it uh, forward as a like minded network that can do so much more yeah. so yeah yes thank and um thank you uh, i do want to say it's not so much for me the experience it's more the passion right it's the passion we have and the beliefs we have in the power of art to transform and yeah. if you have that you have the drive and you go ahead and you go forth and you do it and then the experience comes so for me it's not so much the experience because i've never done all this before but mm -hmm. i do have the support of people like um, um, Carolina Cambronero, Dr. Stephanie Lake, who had so much faith in us and allowing us to be a part of her, of her um, department. Um, and that's what helps us to propel all this. Um, so yes, thank you. If anything else, or shall we close up? Thank you so much. Would you be, if you wanted to check, would you be sharing uh, email? Email. email. So yes. I, I, that would be wonderful. I will share everyone's email here today. I will yes. BCC, so you know if it is so whatever. And then if anybody else wants to connect, you connect with me, and I will do so. Uh, um, um, Nagara, sorry, how do you pronounce? Mine is not all. So <laughs> your name is pronounced how? No, no, you're pronouncing correct. Ah, Nagara, perfect. Too. Okay. There it. are yeah. some emails in the uh, chat. Chat, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but okay. I will copy them and, um, you know, compile them and share them with all. Okay, have a lovely day for those on this side of the world. Thank you, ma'am. Well, good evening bye -bye. on the other side of the world. Bye. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Malini. Thank you. Have Thank a you. Yes, Thank be well, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Thank you. You. bye. bye.